This is Billy Kay, welcoming you to a history of Scottish literature. Programme 5, Twa Corbys and Tartan Noir. I think I write with a Scottish sensibility. You know, people talk about Tartan Noir and say, is there such a thing? And I think in a sense there is. I think we are all underpinned by our literary history. For example, if you're a crime writer and you're Scottish, you don't come through the line that goes, you know, Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Ruth Rendell. You come through a line that goes James Hogg, Stevenson, Conan Doyle, Wally McIlvaney. That's my line of descent as a crime writer. Late to drinking the wine And early pipe the lawn they said to combat them between to fight it in the dawn. The Scottish Gothic goes back to the ballads, these frightful tales of revenge and betrayal and supernatural visitation. And then Stevenson contributes to the Scottish Gothic and Banks and Louise Welsh, Denise Mina, very much part of that tradition of the gruesome, the powerful, the dark, the roots of that are undoubtedly in the ballads. The ballads are great, great works of literature. Norman McCaig once said that you cannot mistake what he called the homicidal hilarity of a laugh in a ballad. You know, you're in that world. Sinister things are happening, revenge is happening, spooky things are going to go on, family loyalties are going to be tested, people are going to die. You're in a better world of drama than anything that contemporary films could ever produce. Alan Riach, Professor of Scottish Literature at Glasgow University, Rory Watson of Stirling University and Val McDermott on an enduring strand in our literature which expresses the vicarious thrill of being close to the fae, the eldritch and the evil. Where does it come from? Murray Pittock of Glasgow University, Elizabeth Ewan of the University of Guelph in Ontario, the poet Kathleen Jamie and the Aberdeenshire writer and tradition bearer Sheena Blackhall. Well, my granny believed them. She didn't think they were horror stories. When she was a young bride, she got to skiing. And when she went into that firm at Hill Heda Kearney as a bride, they were still left in fires to keep a while. There was a laird of skiing, Feather Parks. Now, he'd been dead for about 1,200 years, but he was noted as a warlock, Alexander Skeena Skeen. He's supposed to have crossed the loch of skiing in Anex Frost with a deal. Oh, aye. I once get a burn supper the next. There's a poem written about the warlock by a local man that read it. And farmers come up at the end and they said, my God, he was a terrible man, you know, and they started telling all these stories as if he'd just been there yesterday. He could reast folk, apparently, by a look. If he didn't get peace when he was in an inn, he put a curse on them so they couldn't stop dancing till their feet bled. I liked that. I thought, that's good. I think there's a very strong belief in the supernatural in Scotland, which perhaps goes slightly underground with the Reformation. But I think the ballads remind us that people can put together supernatural belief and approved of religious belief without much difficulty. And in fact, you get ministers of the Kirk in the 17th century writing, for example, The Secret Commonwealth of Elves and Fairies. I did a series on Freemasonry, and there's a quote from an English traveller, I think it is, in the 17th century, saying that Scotland was distinguished by phenomena like the Second Sight. So there's this image yeah. out with Scotland of Scotland being a place where the other side is tangible. I think that's right. But in a way, it's also a construct. There's always a bit in society on the edge where real tradition starts, you know. So it's a question of the distance away you are from, inverted commas, civilization. And I think that was there very much in describing Scotland in the 17th century. But one of the things that happens in the 18th century is that Scottish writers start to make the best of it. Start to say, right, OK, this is us, but we own it and we're going to play with it. I wrote this for Halloween. I've heard tell, but say it low, O warlock steering long ago, Rising grim fae graveyard steen, Would flag the breeks fae ony wain. So gin it's a' the same to you, I'll hug the cheery angle side, Lest with the fairlies in the dew, I micht collide. <laughs> Supernatural 
Shimmer, I think my German called it, of the ballads. Oh, I love that. Yes, I keep harking back to that. And I have some reputation as a so-called nature writer, but I'm awful interested in the animals in the ballads, the speaking animals. The fact that birds can speak, you know, and, and horses can be magical. I think that's you know, terrific. Any particular ballads that you're Oh, I'm thinking to? of Tamlin and Thomas the Rhymer and the Twa Corbys, and especially Thomas the Rhymer with that wonderful supernatural landscape which we access through the Fernie Brae. Oh, isn't that great? That's great. I'd like to write a book called The Fernie Brae. They're also <coughs> engaging things like the supernatural and fate and general spookiness, which my rational part of me does not believe in or any truck with, but, of course, in my veins, I know exactly what they mean. By embracing the supernatural as a kind of sign of being Scottish, sometimes it's humorous, as in Tam O'Shanter, Sometimes it's much more kind of raw Scottish Gothic, as in The Bride of Lammermoor. Douglas Gifford, who taught me here, has established that the Brontes were avid readers of Blackwood's magazine. So, for example, some of the ideas for Wuthering Heights or other novels that are really quite Gothic in nature kind of come from supernatural stories that they might have picked up by Hogg or by any of his contemporaries. So there are lots of ways in which elements of that, specifically Scottish supernatural or Scottish Gothic, actually were reaching a much wider audience than we maybe think they were. Christine McHugh of Glasgow University. This Scots Gothic strand in Romanticism appealed across Europe, with, for example, Pushkin mesmerising the Russian audience when he introduced them to Shatlansky a Piesnia, the Twa Corbys, a ballad collected by Scott for the minstrelsy of the Scottish border and still evoking something primal in a play by Liz Lochhead, Mary Queen of Scots got her head chopped off, and in a novel by Andrew Gregg as they lay bare. It's a ghost story in a way, it's a revenant story, and running right through it are lines and images of the Tor Corbys, and it's about the same themes of betrayal, murder, and mortality. Great Scottish stuff. <laughs> and Crow is piking out the inn I know, oh, I was... night. I mean, the, the violence in Yes, that. I remember it was quite shocking when I was 14, 15. It still is shocking you come across that. And it's done with a kind of dark, almost humour, a relish. As I was walking all alone, I heard twa corbies mac and main that tain them to the tether sails. Where shall we gang and dine the day? Oh, where shall we gang and dine the day? National flower, the thistle. National pastime, nostalgia. National weather, smear, hard, drizzle, snow. National bird, the crow, the corby, the corbeau, la corbeille, moi. How me, eh, 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 voice like a choked laugh, rag bag of a bird in my black dad saw. Angles and elbows and broken oxter feathers, black beady in and my executioner's hood. No bra, but I think I hear a sort of black glamour. Do I not put you in mind of the skating minister? Or on the other foot, the parish priest, the dirty beast? My nests are rickle of sticks. I live on lamb's eyes and road accidents. Or oh, see, after the battle. After the battle, man, it's a pure feast. My eyes are ever big, even for my belly. In lean years of peace, my belly thinks my throat's been cut. We've got that darkness, that obsession with the psyche, but what we've also got that runs through everything, like a line through a tartan, is that black sense of humour. You know, my American wife says, you know, when she first came over here, she said, yeah, honey, I thought you were really mean, bad-tempered and difficult. Then I spent time in Scotland and realised you're just Scottish. And there is that darkness there. There's an English poem called The Two Crows. In it, two crows, they're guarding the body, and his lady is coming back sometime, anytime soon, and his hawk is hanging round to sort of protect the body, and the faithful dog is... You think, is this the difference between these two mentalities? <laughs> this gruesome Scottish thing, and this really very cosy... Sounds like the archers. <laughs> it does. The, 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 the two crows. 
Another writer who came out of the heartland of the border ballads was the Ettrick shepherd James Hogg, whose novel, The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner of 1824, was so far ahead of its time that the Westminster Review accused its author of uselessly and disgustingly abusing his imagination. Thus, it lay dormant until rediscovery by the French author André Gide in 1947. Novelist James Robertson, Ian Campbell of Edinburgh and Cairns Craig of Aberdeen University. What Gide saw in it was precisely the kinds of conflicts that people on the continent had been going through in the 1920s and 30s when what they believed to be true in one decade became a lie in the next decade. And Hogg's novel dramatises that sense of the pliability of truth. I mean, who's talking in that book? The sad truth for me is that sometimes the voice we're listening to is the devil. We don't know who anyone is in this book. Your feet never touch safe ground. It's very upsetting for anyone who wants to be safe, to know right and wrong, to want to know that Christian values are being upheld. In this book, there's really only one person who knows what's going on, and that's the devil. I think critics would now regard The Confessions of the Justified Sinner as one of the major texts of European literature. It's up there, I think, with Dostoevsky as an exploration of psychological inner states, as an exploration of the divided sensibility. And the divided sensibility, of course, has been an issue that's been pursued in Scottish literature for centuries, all the way on to Robert Louis Stevenson and, of course, Jekyll and Hyde. My novel, The Testament of Gideon Mack, definitely is influenced by Robert Louis Stevenson and James Hogg, and probably more than anybody by James Hogg's Confessions of a Justified Sinner, which is a book I've read, I don't know, six, seven, eight times, and still haven't got to the bottom of. I think that's <laughs> going to be the case, however many times I read it in the future. I wanted to take Hogg's ideas and revamp them for the 21st century. My character, Gideon Mack, has a kind of crisis of doubt if you like. He's a sceptic and then suddenly he begins to think maybe I can't trust my scepticism, maybe I have to rethink all of that because maybe there is something after this life or beyond it. He's quite cool the deal in your novel. He wears <laughs> trainers. He wears a dark suit and trainers and the trainers actually let him down a wee bit because he should really have a smart pair of shoes on. Some people I think find the deal in my novel a wee bit disappointing but he's disappointed in himself, you know, because he's, he doesn't have a role anymore. He's wondering about going, what do I do? <laughs> Human beings already doing as much evil as, you know, as they can possibly think of. Nothing that I can do can match the evil of human beings. And God seems to have gone away on holiday somewhere. So the devil himself is a lost soul. As Hogg showed, it's your own blame if you awaken the devil. The devil will give you the right form of justice that you deserve. And Hogg is very traditional that way. I would argue that you've got to keep the Gothic novel well apart from the supernatural novel, in the sense that at the time in England, Monk Lewis and various other writers are writing about lonely, ruined abbeys and screech owls and mad nuns and suits of armour that go walking about in the moonlight. That Gothic hammer house of horror presentation. Douglas Gifford of Glasgow University. Again, though, there's a Caledonian core to many of the works that inspired those monster movies. According to its author Mary Shelley, for example, Frankenstein was born on the blank and dreary northern shores of the Tay, near Dundee. But he didn't stop there. Louise Welsh, Alison Lumsden of Aberdeen and Penny Fielding of Edinburgh University. Victor Frankenstein does go on a whole tour of Great Britain and he visits Edinburgh. So then he goes on from Edinburgh, which he likes, to the Orkney Islands. And he goes there because he wants somewhere very isolated because his creature has asked Frankenstein to create a mate for him, a female creature. And when he's there, he does create a partner for the male monster. But almost immediately afterwards, he tears it into pieces with horror at what he's done. I was brought up for part of my childhood in Edinburgh and that idea of the Gothic being all around you in the buildings and the twists and the winds in the history. You know, Deacon Brodie, when he steps off the scaffold, he says, what is it but a step in the dark? And you think, ah, but 
a step in the dark's quite scary. <laughs> But there are lines like that in your writing. There's one that I loved in The Cutting Room. Some people run from Grandma's house. They long for the bite of the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I guess we, we have that, don't we? We have people that run towards danger sometimes yeah. for, for good reasons yeah. and some people that are just inquiring. <laughs> and have a visceral attraction to danger, stroke sex, death, the big issues that run through the cutting room. I guess so, although, of course, there's a difference to on the page and in real life, and I think, yes. you know, a lot of readers are attracted to that kind of armchair travel through the dark parts of a city, but wouldn't necessarily want to go there, and these books help provide that kind of visceral experience. And I suppose when I read people like Stevenson or those early horror stories that I would read under the blanket with a torch with my sister saying, I'm going to tell mum and dad you're still reading. <laughs> that was what I was searching for, that kind of visceral experience. I'm thinking of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula being written down the road Slane's at Slane's Castle. Castle. Was that again a continuation of this romanticism turning into gothic? You could put many good arguments together for the Scottish psyche lending itself to the Gothic, particularly when you're in Aberdeen in November. That wouldn't be too hard a leap to make. I'm slightly reluctant to draw those kinds of wider conclusions because equally you find that throughout European romanticism. There's a point where imagination is bound to slip towards an excess of imagination. I love Edgar Allan Poe. And, of course, we have the Scottish connection there as well. He came to Irvine. <laughs> and he's in a Scottish family, basically. And you can see, I think, some of our folklore and themes very strongly in his writing. The Gothic came naturally to young Edgar Allan Poe following a sojourn in Irvine at the height of the body-snatching epidemic of 1815, when fresh cadavers were procured for the anatomy class at Glasgow University. Edgar's primary school was just over the wall from the Kirkyard. Robert Louis Stevenson combines Scottish tales of the supernatural with European Gothic. The reader is Eileen McCallum. I'll tell you enough, a favourite story of mine is Stevenson's Thrawn Janet. I love Thrawn Janet. Oh, yes. It's a neck that's thrown and twisted. <laughs> ah, it's a twisted and thrown. It's a super story. <laughs> There were many grave folk lang o'er their prayers that night. But when the morn come, there was sick a fear fell upon all but weary that the bairns hid theirselves, and even the men folk stood and kick it for their doors. For there was Janet coming doon the clachan. Her or her likeness, none could tell, with her neck thrown, and her head on a side like a body that has been hanged, and a gurn on her face like an unstreaked corp. By and by, they got yeased with it, and even speared at her to ken what was wrong. But fra that day forth, she couldna speak like a Christian woman, but slavered and played click with her teeth like a pair of shears. And fra that day forth, the name of God come never on her lips. While she would try to say it, but it michna be. Them that ken best said least, but they never gave that thing the name of Janet McClure. For the old Janet, by their way out, was in muckle hell that day. He's picking up an existing Gothic, which is all over Europe at the time. And of course, that's what helps to make a novel like Jekyll and Hyde publishable. It was called a shilling shocker, because people wanted to buy shocking novels to give to their friends for Christmas. And that's how Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was written. It was a shilling shocker. But the more you read it, the more penetrating it is. There's a lot of criticism that looks at it in psychological terms, psychoanalytical terms. There's a lot of repression. And someone who teaches science fiction, like me, is also fascinated by the fact that Stevenson's playing with the question of drugs, of anaesthesia, 
of the inner self, which at the time was only just being explored. The problem is the hypocrisy, and if he hadn't been a hypocrite, none of this would have happened. You know, I think that's, the, for me, the message of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Let's not hide things away. Let's not be ashamed. The duality is the interesting thing. It's our capability to switch. It's our capability to live most of our life in one persona, but the capability to switch and be a different person in a different set of circumstances, particularly if we think nobody's going to find out about it. I don't believe in evil as an entity. People sometimes write about evil almost like it's something you catch if you go out without a vest on. I think people are capable of tremendous horror in their relationships with other human beings. But nobody is, I think, the embodiment of some sort of evil force. To say that, I think, lets the rest of us off the hook. Ian Rankin is a novelist who openly admits his admiration for Stevenson and for that tradition. In fact, one of his earlier novels, Hide and Seek, is a brilliant rendition of some of the themes and characters of Jekyll and Hyde, but set in modern-day Edinburgh. So in Hide and Seek, the villains turn out to be a rich association of Edinburgh professionals who are running an illegal boxing competition where homeless people and drug addicts are paid to fight each other. And I guess that idea of what is hidden behind closed doors, let's not be afraid of the people that are out and about and flamboyant. Let's not be afraid of same-sex marriage. Let's not be afraid of any of these things. Let us be afraid of the respectable people that are telling us how we should behave. Louise Welsh whose novel The Cutting Room is darkly compelling and has at its core a disturbing story of pornography. Its origins, though, are in a lighter morality tale told by an antique dealer sent to clear a house in Glasgow. When my friend arrived at the house, the old women were in the back with a big, big bonfire and he went round to the garden and there they were poking the bonfire and he said, uh, what's, what's all this? And he looked and some of this pornography was really old stuff. And he said, some of this is worth a lot of money. <laughs> and the old women started to beat the fire out and take the, the dirty pictures or, or whatever out of them. There's no coincidence that Frankie Boyle's Scottish. These are the roots of what makes us laugh. And that darkness sits particularly well with the examination of the Scottish psyche. And those features find their way into Scottish crime fiction. And I very much feel that that's where a lot of the most exciting crime fiction is coming from these days. It's coming from Scotland, it's coming from Ireland, where they've suddenly discovered crime fiction. And the English, frankly, are just doing retreads. That's going to get me into a lot of big trouble, but it's how I feel. You're going to do fewer readings in England in the future. <laughs> Val McDermott who's the first to acknowledge her debt to Willie McIlvanny and the tradition they both belong to. I remember reading Laidlaw and just thinking, oh, my God, this is the first time I had read a crime novel that was written from the perspective of a Scottish vernacular that I understood and a Scottish world that I understood, working-class lives. It actually made me understand that mine was a language I could use. You've been influential in influencing a lot of people. I know. That kind of amazed me, especially with the the Laidlaw books when I heard that I was the father of Tartanoir. When you don't like Tartanoir, as I said to Ian Rankin myself, I said it reminds me of a Glasgow heavy in Highland dress. <laughs> I haven't seen too many of them about. But no, I was kind of overwhelmed when I, I went for the first time to Stirling for Bloody Scotland and was being told how much I had meant to other writers. It was great, great feeling. But right. as I said, it was like in a, a pension of esteem you didn't know you had earned. I felt benignity all around me, which is a good feeling. So all these folk that write about psychopaths, nutters, violent, perverts, they're actually the nicest folk in the world. Charming people. I suppose what happens is they get, they get all the bad stuff out on the page. One of my favourite books of yours is A Place of Execution, and the dedication is to my evil twin. Are there two of you? Is there a good lassie for Fife <laughs> and an evil doppelganger that takes her into dark places nobody else wants to go? No, I have a friend in New Orleans who is almost exactly the same birthday as me and we always joke that, you know, she's the evil twin and I'm the good twin. <laughs> there isn't a dark side to me, that's the thing. The dark side is all in the books. The human being has no dark side. This is Val describing the arrival of the police in a remote village in the Peak District of Derbyshire the place of execution. 
In the eerie light of the moon, George could see fields of rough pasture rising gently from the road that bisected the valley floor. Sheep huddled together against the walls, their breath brief puffs of steam in the freezing air. Darker patches revealed themselves as areas of coppiced woodland as they drove past. George had never seen the like. It was a secret world, hidden and separate. Now he could see lights, feeble against the moon's silver gleam, but strong enough to outline a straggle of buildings against the pale limestone reefs at the far end of the dale. That's Scardale, Grundy said needlessly from the back seat. I think when I'm writing about England, although I've lived there for a long time, I always write about it as somebody from the outside. And I think that's one of the great tropes of crime fiction is the eye of the outsider brought to bear on a way of life that can examine it dispassionately, that has the wit to see it as an insider sees it, but has the distance and the detachment to look at it from the viewpoint of somebody who's not part of it, who somehow ultimately can walk away from this and not be affected by it. You're thinking about the visceral nature of fear and also what does fear do physically to us? And I'm, I'm sure you're the same whenever you get something bad happens or something scary happens. With most writers, there's that wee bit of you that stands outside, the not very nice part of you perhaps, that stands outside and looks and thinks, well, this is interesting, how does this feel? I'll, I'll, I'll think about this and probably use it later. That's why novelists aren't always nice people, I think. <laughs> the modern crime novel, in many ways, is perhaps the, the modern version of the old ballad, obviously longer. It's still those Themes of passion, of love, of hate, of crime, of jealousy, of envy, those are still all there. It's a way of dealing with the uncertainties of the world. The ballads were the popular literature of the past. Crime novels are the popular literature of the present. Elizabeth Ewan, from the Twa Corbys to Tartan Noir, her artists have depicted evil at a remove. But I confronted my former tutor at Edinburgh University, Ian Campbell, with a rumour I'd heard that placed a famous Scottish writer in the very heart of the darkness, which brought an evil period in 20th century history to an end, Der Untergang. Is it true that Hitler had a copy of Carlyle in the bunker when he died? It is true that Goebbels had a copy of Carlyle in the bunker and was said to be reading bits of the history of Frederick the Great to Hitler, who had a picture of Frederick the Great in the bunker. So yes, that's true. But the fact that that story has been used to tar Carlyle with a brush of the downfall is just ridiculous. 